All right, thank you so much for having me. This is a fantastic event. I'm looking forward to attending some of the other uh, workshops and uh, lectures as well. So we're gonna talk about three major influencers uh, in sustainability today. And of course that's materials, um, how they're made and how we're using them across different sectors. And uh, innovation inspired by nature, so biomimicry. Uh, if that's a new word for everybody, uh, I'm happy to introduce that today. And then this other sneaky human solution that we're just starting to identify um, the leverage it has on how it can um, positively affect uh, reversing global warming, and that's education. And what a perfect platform to discuss that than right here at FIT. So it's said that the 20th century is a, sem is a century of chemistry, with humans making almost 50 million chemicals. Uh, and the 21st century, our century, is going to be the century of biology. So let's start with, um, well, why are you listening to me today? Uh, so I'm a designer. I'm not actually a traditional scientist coming to this sphere. Um, I have a grow studio in Brooklyn, New York. Um, have had this for about eight years and got into biomaterials kind of accidentally. I started with hydroponics, and that was really taking um, this innovation that could be the future of how we grow uh, our food in urban environments, encapsulating that into a user-friendly and accessible design um, that we can incorporate into our daily lives. So the natural thing after that was really biofabrication. And that was kind of accidental. I came across this amazing material um, that's using a living organism, mycelium, the roots of mushrooms, and we started growing with it. And uh, I grow lampshades um, from this material in our studio in Brooklyn, New York. So it was kind of an accidental uh, discovery period getting into science again, and uh, that led me to getting into biomimicry and going further down the rabbit hole. So let's first talk about biomaterials. What do they mean? Uh, what are they? Natural, synthesized in a lab. What are the ingredients? We'll just go through a couple of them today. Um, what I find to be most exciting right now with applications that are coming out, um, even right here at FIT, uh, and that's working with bacteria, yeast, algae, even greenhouse gases, so methane and carbon dioxide. We can actually build with these, just like nature does. Uh, so a few examples. Um, biofabricating materials, uh, uh, specifically fabrics, uh, replacement, replacing leather that's not sustainably produced um, with ones that are grow grown in a lab from yeast, um, uh, dying with bacteria, and producing <laughs> our goods with algae. Even using, uh, I'll go back to that one, even using um, uh, living organisms as a part of our body and becoming actuators, so changing with the, the environment that our body changes with. If we sweat, they open up and to allow us to aerate. So creating this symbiotic relationship um, to kind of change how we think about how we are connected with nature. Uh, Bio-cement. So now we're getting into the construction materials. Uh, how we can capture CO2 using cement. Um, and cement is one of those uh, materials, man-made materials, that actually is a huge contributor towards emissions. And if we could be capturing CO2 uh, passively in our infrastructure, think about the power that has. Um, also, 3D printing. We're now 3D printing with a bunch of different materials, bioplastics, uh, mycelium, algae, uh, and capturing methane to produce bioplastics. There's a, car there's a company called Air Carbon that's capturing CO2 um, at point capture, so it's um, at high uh, CO2 outputs on factories, and condensing this into a biomaterial, and now they're contracting with IKEA to make furniture. So we've come a long way in such a short period of time with biomaterials alone. So my involvement and, and what I what I know most is working with fungi. And we're really closely related to fungi. That's a, that's a fun fact of, um, you can see on the tree of life there that animals are closer related to fungi than plants are, and so are humans. So we begin to establish this relationship of how we connect to it. Mycelium, the roots, 
of mushrooms. So we eat the fruiting body. So this, this crazy network, this mycorrhizal network of mycelia uh, grow beneath the forest floor. It binds um, together with the soil. It cleans the soil. It connects all plants and trees in an ecosystem, distributes nutrients, uh, water. It's a generous, it's a giving organism. And it's one of the largest on terrestrial Earth. So this is a network in Oregon that is uh, 2.4 miles uh, long and estimated at 2,000 years old. So it's <laughs> something that's so tiny that you might see just poking out of a felled tree in a forest actually is just the tip of the iceberg of um, how amazing this, this living organism is. And we're just starting to understand its capacity. Um, this is the image, the colorful image to uh, your left or right is uh, an image of the internet. And that's in comparison to the other image, which is that of mycelial ne networks. So if you start thinking about the communication capacity of this living organism, how does it send signals? How does it warn an entire forest of impending danger um, rapidly just by using chemical pulses? So how do we bring this into our lives uh, as humans? Um, so I started working with, with this material. Um, I, I, I cannot take all the credit. Um, a biomaterials company, Ecovative, in upstate New York and Troy, uh, was already working with this in packaging. Um, I ordered samples, loved the material, started growing with it, and um, realized that one of the best applications uh, in the interiors environment was that of a lampshade. And so this is an image of um, the substrate. So we use hemp. Um, so what the mycelium, we're, we're basically mimicking the environment that the organism naturally wants to grow in, creating a happy little biome. And the mycelium is going to bind to and digest the cellulose in the hemp. And it's also going to add structure to the form. So we adapted a, um, a process to, uh, they call it tooling, um, to where we're going to form the, the shape of the shade. And you can see there's no white whatsoever in this mold. And over time, it's going to grow, and it's going to fill that form. And all the mycelium, all the white that you see in these lights, in these lamps, is the mycelium. There's no paint outside of that interior um, color. But these are all grown and bound together just using nature's glue. And it's doing this by growing and binding together. So the manufacturing process alone is wrapped up into nature's process of growth. So it's an interesting way to start thinking about how we, um, what kind of water or energy uh, or light is put into, um, or heat is put into our growing process. So we're doing this at ambient con um, conditions with very little water whatsoever. And we're just letting the power of nature grow. So we're not adding any energy into the process. Uh, we do bake the lampshades at the end. Um, so that basically ensures that it won't continue to grow, won't sprout mushrooms, and won't spore. Um, so we worked with Ecovative later on to create a grow-it-yourself lamp. Because I think one of the most powerful things to do is not limit this to certain industries or players um, but to open that technology to everyone and to say that you don't have to be a scientist to be able to work with these living organisms. They should be accessible to everyone. And the more that we can talk about them and explore together with them, we can imagine different applications. And we can affect industries at a faster rate, um, including the built environment. So uh, a few years back at MoMA PS1, the living uh, grew a 40-foot tower uh, consisting of mushroom blocks. Um, what else? So we've got you know high-end packaging, um, furniture, um, leathers. Um, leathers is the new hot one right now, and performance foams. Being able to replace uh, our unsustainable materials, those that are toxic, not only to ourselves but to the environment, with something that's completely natural and that's going to biodegrade in your backyard, it's going to add nutrients back to the soil rather than pollutants. And that's, that's kind of the, the segue into biomimicry. So looking not only at just the materiality, but the bigger systems, the process, 
and the design thinking of how do we integrate everything into a cyclical um, system. And I love this quote, nature doesn't make things, nature hides things. Um, it's, it's pretty powerful as all the nutrients cycle in one environment. Um, no, there's no waste created in a forest. Um, everything is used. And depending on um, the location of the ecosystem, like the tropics, those nutrients are, are being fought over. They're quickly being absorbed and put back into the biomass that's contributing to some other um, life-sustaining mechanism. So let's talk about bio-whats, as we call it. There's a lot of names being thrown out right now. Um, we were just talking about biofabrication, which is really closely related to bio-utilization and bio-assisted technology. And that's using a living organism to create um, a product. Uh, I mean, wood, any, anything that we use with wood, that's bio-utilization. It's a very fancy word, but um, it definitely falls in that category. Biomorphism and biophilic design are definitely looking at the form and the aesthetic of nature and tapping into our innate um, biophilia that we're all born with um, and trying to bring that into our living systems, trying to incorporate more life um, and the, uh, the connection that we have with a certain aesthetic. Um, it doesn't necessarily go super deep into the functionality, uh, and that's where biomimicry kind of comes in at a deeper level of understanding, well, why did that organism, why does it look the way it does? Has it evolved in a certain way to respond to the context pressures that it lives in? And then matching that up to human design challenges. Um, and then the last one, bioengineering, and that's really manipulating the genome, um, which is a, a whole nother conference. <laughs> um, so let's look at biomimicry a bit more. So the Latin, looking at the Latin um, terms bios and mimesis is life and imitation. So imitating life. Um, the next big idea is sustainability is probably a million years old. So we're a very young species. Um, if we look at the cosmic calendar, I know you guys are, have seen this before, um, but this is all of life on this planet condensed to a calendar year. Humans don't show up to the last minute. We don't show up on this calendar until the last minute before midnight of the calendar year. So that's how young we are as a species. Um, so all the, the organisms that have come before us um, really are a living library of the secrets and strategies of what it takes to evolve and survive on this planet, to get along, um, to create systems that um, work together. And uh, these words are chosen very carefully. The conscious emulation of nature's genius. Conscious meaning that we intent, we have intent. We're going out into nature and we're seeking the, sol the solutions from nature. And then conscious, um, uh, sorry, and then emulation being that we are going to, to look deeper into those patterns and, and figure out what it means. Can we find the functionality of it? and then mimic that. And then nature is genius because after 3.8 billion years, uh, nature has figured out what works and what doesn't. And what doesn't has become fossils. Um, all the organisms that exist on the planet today, there's a range between eight to 10 million, some say a whole lot more. So everything that exists outside today is only one tenth of 1% of all life that's ever existed on this planet. That's crazy, that's a crazy amount. Right? So that means 99.9% .9 of life has gone extinct because it couldn't figure out how to fit in um, to this dynamic, always changing environment. Uh, so that's why we really can use the, the natural world as a, a model of how best to fit in uh, consciously. And we do this in, in several ways of practicing biomimicry. We're looking at form process, and ecosystem. And just to give you a quick brief of what it is to actually do biomimicry. So a couple examples is um, uh, an avid birder was out walking in the forest and his dog is getting all these birds stuck to him. And he looks into this and why, why can this, um, 
this burr hang on so tight. Why can't I have to like always cut it out? And what they found was there was little hooks and loops. Um, so simple, this, this very elegant design. Um, we've mimicked that in human, um, human application, and that's how you get Velcro. But the important thing was it was understanding and identifying, and what we do in biomimicry is say, well, how does nature do this? And it's usually a verb. So instead of saying, well, I'm trying to create a light or a lamp, you're saying, you're asking, well, are you creating a lamp or do you really want to illuminate something? Uh, so it's a different way of looking at the problem and the challenge that's at hand. How does nature clean? Does it use uh, microscopic uh, bumps and um, a structure on its skin to ward off bacteria? Um, does it use an osmotic uh, uh, pressure on the surface of its skin so it can be able to move through soil seamlessly? Um, or does it use some kind of physical uh, maneuver that's built into um, the actual structure of its shape um, where it's flinging off dirt? How does nature protect? Um, is it using these tiny little hairs at, because it lives in a high altitude to absorb damaging UV light? Um, so that the plant can survive? Is it made from super strong materials that once again are made um, from uh, at ambient temperatures? So spider silk is made in place, ambient temperatures, very little energy, and it's stronger than steel. And how does nature cycle nutrients? Something that we're really, really trying to grapple with right now as a human uh, problem. Um, being able to to uh, reabsorb a nutrient to, to then shed its own skin or shell to produce a new, new one. Uh, we talked about mycelium and how mycelium is the generous organism. It is spreading the nutrients to those that need it. And even bacteria. Bacteria can create biopolyesters right now just using enzymes and proteins. So we're looking at nature as a model um, for innovation. And this really sums up the difference between biomimicry and a lot of the other bio what's, is it's valuing nature not for what we can extract, harvest, or domesticate, but for what we can learn. Um, are we still viewing nature as just uh, a limitless um, uh, raw materials bank? Um, so, or are we, can, we, can we listen? Um, can we learn? Can nature be a mentor to us? And we're looking at that right now in cities. Can cities be redesigned that they're not only net zero, but they're actually net positive? They are generous. <laughs> How often are we saying that in our language right now when it comes to any kind of business? That instead of um, what we're taking, it's what we can give out in return. And finally, we use life's principles, which is uh, a whole nother lecture in itself, and it's the deeper patterns and principles that get across all taxa and what they use collectively to stay alive. Can we use those measurements as, um, as real metrics for sustainability? Not human metrics, but nature's time-tested metrics. So thinking about city as a forest, can you go outside and compare what that forest in that location of that city 100, 200 years ago, what it used to produce in terms of capturing carbon dioxide, building soil, um, storing and cleaning rainwater. And can we build that into the metrics that we need to measure up against as we redesign our cities and our systems? Um, so imagine NYC meeting the same ecological performance standards as a wildland next door. And these aren't aspirational goals, right? They happened. We have the model. It existed at some period of time. So that really is the challenge of can we get back to that place? Uh, and then what I love about biomimicry is you have to go outside to learn. You get away from the computer, you get away from the classroom, and you get to start quieting your human cleverness and looking at a deeper observational level of learning how. Um, and it's really about this reconnection. 
right? So sustainability, we can do all these different things of creating better biomaterials and systems, but if we aren't actively re-engaging and recommitting to a relationship, understanding that we are not apart from nature, we are a part of nature, that we're never gonna be able to flip that script, we're never gonna be able to change our mindset about how to live consciously and connected. And the final thing I wanna talk about, and this is a really new subject for me, and um, I feel like it's very relevant in uh, at this platform, and that's the power that education has in sustainability. Uh, so Paul Hawken, um, a couple years back, um, organized a bunch of scientists, entrepreneurs, um, researchers from all around the world, and they uh, compiled 100 of the most effective strategies to combating global warming that are happening right now or in the near future. They extrapolated all of these um, different strategies uh, over the next 25, 50 years and then measured them. And they found some surprising results. Women and girls, specifically educating girls, took up a huge bite of all that. So you see materials as the purple, um, the purple block, and then you've got women and girls as this larger section. And that was a really su a big surprise. We're constantly thinking that innovation and systems and materials, food, transportation, all those things are vitally important. But information flows and having accessibility to information to empower um, and change the perspective um, and give opportunity. So I think having different opportunities um, and more informed choices. So as they were looking at this, they realized that educating women and girls all over the world um, is more, they're more effective stewards of food, soil, trees, and land use. Um, and they were, had a greater capacity to cope with the shocks from natural disasters and extreme weather. So they were, they were more likely to have a positive effect on any of kind of the extremes that are about to transpire. And they could plan ahead. Um, and so I think it's interesting that materials, alternative cement, bioplastics are really high up on the list for materials. They're number 36 and 47. And education was number six, um, right after uh, solar and wind. So that's how powerful um, this can be of just transferring information. And to understand where we're at, we really have to look at where we've come from. And that's not only um, physically, but historically and culturally. And um, I think the best thing is that we're realizing our power and we're sharing information. We're sharing information, whether it's in the boardroom or the classroom or on the streets. Um, information flows and uh, being able to have access to that is, is one of the most powerful things right now that we're just starting to be able to measure in terms of what that can do for reversing global warming and our sustainability efforts. So I'll, I'll leave you with this. Uh, you cannot go through a single day without having an impact on the world around you. What you do makes a difference, and you have to decide what kind of difference you want to make. This was uh, by Jane Goodall. And um, I take this as a responsibility. And I think now that we've all heard a lot of this information, like the responsibility has now been passed. And that's to, to share with somebody else and to keep those information flows continuous. Uh, so it's been a real pleasure to be able to speak about these things. And I hope that you share them. And thank you very much for your time.